Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be a pleasing offering to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So what are we doing here today? Why are we reading from the book of Proverbs? Many of you are probably thinking, what cool stories are in the book of Proverbs? Some of you are probably thinking, what terrifying stories are in the book of Proverbs? The truth is, neither of those are in the book of Proverbs. What is the point of these writings? Well, as you heard what I was mentioning as I was reading it, wisdom literature is about character formation, which I know that sounds really cool and exciting, doesn't it? Yes, character formation. And it is primarily addressed to young men with a kind of fatherly tone to it. It's designed to help these young men. The basic idea is you live well by being good. You live well by being good. Now, us mainline churches, we don't tend to talk too much about the so-called wisdom books of the Hebrew Bible. We will often use psalms in our worship. And of course, the story of Job might show up from time to time, but Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, don't really figure much in our reading of the Bible. But wisdom literature is something that united many of the cultures of the ancient Near East. Both Egypt and Babylon utilized wisdom literature, and some of their wisdom literature has actually made its way into the Hebrew Bible. It came from a belief that the gods created an orderly world, and it was a human responsibility to live in harmony with that order. And that's where wisdom literature comes in. You do well by being good. And the ancient Israelites incorporated many of those wisdom beliefs into their own religious life, but of course they put a monotheistic spin on it. It was no longer the gods, it was their one god, Yahweh. And this sermon series for the next few weeks is devoted to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and it's about how do we live a good life. Interestingly enough, for a long time, the rabbis used to teach that um, Song of Songs, now how many of you have read Song of Songs? How many of you have actually read a few? Oh, come on, there's at least a few people when they were teenage boys, they had you looked in that book. I'm serious, come on. Okay. The, the, the rabbis used to believe that, that Song of Songs was written by Solomon when he was a young man. The Proverbs was then written when he was a mature adult, and then Ecclesiastes was written when he was an embittered old man. Now, these books were actually written hundreds of years after Solomon's time. They might incorporate some of Solomon's material, but he didn't actually write them. But it's kind of a kind of an interesting way to think about it, because of course Song of Songs is love poetry. You know, Proverbs is very much conventional wisdom, and Ecclesiastes is kind of at odds with the world because it acknowledges that there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of challenges in life that don't neatly resolve themselves. So what do we mean when we talk about wisdom? We use that word in so many different ways. When your mother says to you, are you going to be a wise guy? She is not paying you a compliment. It is not a good thing to be a wise guy. So what do we mean when we talk about wisdom? Some people we traditionally associate with wisdom, and often that is people who are, shall we say, more chronologically advanced. In fact, the word wisdom in English comes from the word, the same word as the word white, because wise people have white hair, and you know, da, 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 da. Is that really the case, though? There are definitely older people that are wise, but there are also older people that act like younger people, so. The Bible has two different words that it uses for wisdom. In the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, it uses the word chachma. And in the New Testament, in Greek, it uses the word sophia. So yes, this name sophia means wisdom. Interestingly enough, both of those nouns are, he, are, 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 um, are 
gendered as female, which is really interesting. And a lot of mystics have had a lot of fun with that, the fact that wisdom is feminine in these languages. But in short, wisdom is a type of knowledge. It's a, but it's a specific kind of knowledge. It's practical knowledge. It's the knowledge that you need to live well. And it's not based on any revelation from heaven, but on experience and observation. It's a lot like what we might call common sense today. An Old Testament theologian, I, Ellen Davis, she says it, I think, the best. She says, the Proverbs are spiritual guides for ordinary people in, on an ordinary day when the water does not pour forth from rocks and angels do not come to lunch. Proverbs are spiritual guides for ordinary people on an ordinary day when water does not pour forth from rocks and angels do not come to lunch. Well, she obviously didn't live in Iowa because water kind of comes out of everywhere. I don't know about angels showing up for lunch, but water does seem to come out of everywhere. So wisdom literature talks about common, everyday things like commerce and friendship, and work, and family, and sex. These are all very ordinary things that are talked about in wisdom literature. At the same time, I do have a few misgivings about our wisdom literature. Because it seems to me, as you read Proverbs, it has this assumption that if you do something good, it will always return good to you. And if you do something bad, it will return bad action, bad consequences. It's called act consequence thinking, act consequence. And the truth is we know that's not how the world really works. We know that good actions don't always guarantee a good, a good result. We also know that bad actions don't always result in a bad action, a bad result. And unfortunately, we also know that it becomes easy to blame those on the margin of society because by flipping the logic around, you can always say that bad actions must lead to bad results. So therefore, you've got bad results, therefore you must have made some mistake. You must have done something wrong for this to happen to you. And of course, to say that, well, that's not a message that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus or the prophets. So we always need to be careful with wisdom literature. We can't ad adopt that easy, you know, and, you know cause effect thinking. Because the world doesn't really quite work that way. It might work that way if God were able to, at this point, in full control of the world, but God isn't right now. It doesn't work the way God want, would want it to work. So good actions won't always produce good results, and bad actions won't always produce bad results. Even so, these books are in our Bibles, and we can and should use them. But at the same time, it's not the same thing as common sense. Earlier I said it's kind of like common sense. And I think it's important to remember it's like <laughs> common sense. Because it has some very significant differences from common sense. First, wisdom insists that you always act virtuously. Always act virtuously when common sense and the culture that we live in frequently tells us that nice guys always finish last. Honesty is for suckers. You know, these are the messages that our culture, that's what common sense would tell us. But biblical wisdom tells us that you need to be virtuous no matter what. You need to be generous to the needy. You need to lend without charging interest. That's not common sense. The Bible's wisdom is fundamentally countercultural. It looks very different from common sense because you are virtuous no matter what. And why are you virtuous no matter what? Because ultimately wisdom is grounded in a God-centered view of the world. It is God-centered. It isn't man-centered. It isn't me-centered. It is God-centered. And it starts with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
Now, fear of God is a tough thing for us. I was listening to a podcast about this passage, and they were talking about the challenges of how do you render fear of the Lord into English? There really isn't an analog in our culture. There isn't a way to easily talk about it. So Rolf Jacobson, the Lutheran scholar, he argued that fear of the Lord really means to truly appreciate who God is. To truly appreciate who God is. Because we can fear of the Lord recognizes God's great power, and it responds accordingly, and yes, there might even be a little fear in there. Because after all, God is God, and we are not. Jacobson also likens fear of the Lord to the ocean. There's a few of you that I know are sailors, and you could probably identify with this, that sailors can love the ocean, but they also recognize its incredible power that both nurtures and destroys, that both carries you to your destination or prevents you from getting there. You always need to have a healthy respect for the ocean. And that's something like what fear of the Lord is. And farmers, you can probably identify that with how we understand nature, right? Because rain can come at the right time and nurture the crops, but it can also come at the wrong time and in a torrent and destroy them. The same sun that allows for photosynthesis also can scorch and kill. Nature is also this power that must be respected and feared. And our actions are rooted in the realization that God is the center of our lives. Now, there are some practical implications here. I know you're saying, Chris, Chris, you just said wisdom literature is practical. But so far, you've said all these really heady things. I've also said it's supposedly practical and not philosophical when I said a whole bunch of philosophical things. So here's some practical examples. I had a parishioner in my last church. He was a very shrewd businessman. Um, one time he came to me and he was so excited because he had found this antique, and I don't remember what it was. I think it was some sort of a little box. He had found it, you know, this little lady at a garage sale was selling it. He bought it for like 30 bucks. And he was so excited because he turned around. Uh-oh. What happened here? I used the good battery this time. Hmm. That's interesting. I did use the good battery, but ah. okay. Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. So he was a very shrewd businessman, and like I said, he found this this uh, cool little antique. He picked it up from a lady at a. Um, you're just not going to do this. Okay, never mind. I'm just going to have to... Oh, wait, 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 wait. Shh. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, whoever, so whoever it was that was sabotaging my battery didn't work. <laughs> Although this battery is really low, so we'll have to make this quick. But anyway, so he was saying that um, you know, he, he picked up this cool antique and he bought it from a little lady at a, at a, at a garage sale for $30, $30. And he turned around and sold it for $300. And he was so excited about that. Of course, I'm thinking, wow, I mean, that poor little lady really had no idea what she had, did she? He did what is common sense. You know, maximize your profits. Pay as little as you can. Charge as much as you can. But maybe, following the wisdom of God, maybe he would have considered sharing a little bit of that proceeds with the original person. Another thing that our wisdom comes into play is being honest. When you're selling something, be honest about what you're selling. Don't hang a poster over a hole in the wall in the house you're selling. Because I know that staging people do exactly that. But you're honest. That's what it means to be follow the wisdom of God, to be honest. Even if it may not seem to be common sense. Another, another piece of God's wisdom that may not seem like common sense is paying wages. Now, I know most of you who have employees, you probably can't afford to pay your employees a living wage, but are you paying your employees 
as much as you can afford? Or are you settling for paying them at less than that? Again, this isn't about common sense. This is about living according to the wisdom of God. It might be that that is all you can afford, and that's well and good. But that's a question you need to ask yourself. Can I afford to pay them more? Now, I know some of you are thinking, oh gosh, Chris, so share a little bit of the wealth, be honest about what you're selling, maybe pay a little bit better. Is this really realistic? But see, that's what I mean when I said that wisdom is not about common sense. It's about placing God first and foremost in your life. Common sense would have you guard yourself, only revealing as much as you absolutely can, or absolutely must. Only pay as much as you absolutely must and earn as high of a profit as you absolutely can. That's what common sense would have you do. But see, we are living a God-centered life, not a me-centered life. It's kind of what my college professor used to call a moral faith. It means you live your life morally and operating under the assumption that that will work out. That's what real faith is. Putting your money where your mouth is. And it's not easy. But this is how the prophets and the apostles who came before us have lived. It's how the saints have lived. It is how Jesus lived. So as this coming week, as we start this sermon series on wisdom literature, be thinking about this, about how do you live a God-centered ethic? How do you follow the wisdom of God, the fear of God that is the beginning of wisdom? You do it by doing things that don't always make common sense, but they are in, a, in a concordance with God's ordering of this universe, being virtuous always. You do well by being good.